Welcome to Cinema's Underbelly, the channel where we dive into the deepest, darkest trenches of the underground to analyze and review the most obscure, obscene, and controversial films that cinema has to offer. I'm your host, Jonathan Doe, and today we will be reviewing the infamous Junko Furuta Exploitation Collection. This review centers on three notorious Japanese exploitation films, all centered around the infamous Junko Furuta murder case. Junko Furuta was a 17-year-old girl who attended Yoshio Minami High School during the late 1980s. Around 8.30 p.m. on November 25, 1988, fellow classmate, 18-year-old Hiroshi Miyano, who had been rejected by Furuta, along with his friends, 16-year-old Nabaharu Minato, 17-year-old Joe Agora and 17-year-old Yasushi Watanabe abducted Furuta. The four boys took her to the house where Minato lived with his parents. Minato and Miyano had low-ranking gang affiliations with the Yakuza, which instilled fear in Furuta from trying to escape, as well as Minato's parents from reporting to the police that the girl was being held captive in their home. To avoid a police investigation, the boys forced Furuta to call her parents and tell them that she had run away and was safe staying with a friend. For 40 days, Furuta was held captive in the Minato residence. During this time, she endured unimaginable acts of abuse, torture, and rape. She was forced to be naked most of the time, and the group of boys regularly invited and encouraged their Yakuza friends to come over and torment and rape Furuta. She was regularly beaten and starved. She was hung from the ceiling and used as a punching bag. She was forced to eat cockroaches and drink urine. On multiple occasions, she had barbells dropped onto her stomach. She repeatedly had parts of her body doused in lighter fluid and set on fire. A hot light bulb and lit fireworks were inserted into her anus and vagina. She had hot candle wax dripped into her eyes. Her left nipple was ripped off with pliers and her breasts were pierced with sewing needles. The beatings were often so severe that Fruta would lose consciousness and slip into convulsions. Thinking that she was faking a seizure, the boys would light her on fire. The injuries to her body became so significant that she lost her ability to walk, ingest food, or control her bladder, resulting in her receiving further beatings for having accidents on the carpet. In the end, the boys admitted to having raped Furuta more than 400 times. Approximately 100 people knew about Furuta's captivity, but either neglected to report it or themselves participated in her torture. On January 4th, 1989, after losing a table game, Miyano decided to take out his frustration on Furuta, leading the other boys to join in. At this point, Furuta was barely alive. The beating reportedly lasted for two hours. Furuta was apparently bleeding to such an extent, in addition to her infected and untreated body burns oozing with pus, that the boys wrapped their hands in plastic so that they could continue to beat her without touching her fluids. Furuta eventually succumbed to her injuries and died that day. Fearing a murder charge, the group wrapped Furuta's body in blankets and then shoved her into a travel bag. They then put her body in a 55-gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. They then disposed of the drum onto a construction site in Koto, Tokyo. On January 24, 1989, police found the drum containing Furuta's body. When her body was removed from the concrete, they discovered that glass soda bottles had been inserted into her anus and her face was so disfigured that it was unrecognizable, resulting in her having to be identified via fingerprints. She was also found to be pregnant, despite the severe damage to her uterus. Miyano, Agora, Watanabe, and Minato were all arrested for the murder of Junko Furuta. However, all four boys were protected by special provisions applied to individuals aged 18 years or younger and so the maximum sentence any of them received was 20 years, with most of the boys receiving less than 10. Due to the way in which Fruta's body was discovered, the murder came to be known as the Concrete Encased High School Girl Murder Case, which subsequently became the title for director Katsuo Matsumura's first feature film detailing the tragedy. Released less than five years after Fruta's death, Concrete Encased High School Girl Murder Case presents like most typical 90s true crime drama programs. It is hosted by a man who narrates the events of Fruta's abduction, torture, and murder, 
accompanied with relatively tame reenactments of each event. The film also contains small moments of actual footage from the case, sprinkled throughout the presentation. Out of all of the films made centered around the murder of Junko Furuta, I see this one as putting in the most effort for historical accuracy. Two years later, in 1997, director Gunji Kawasaki would release Juvenile Crime, also known as Schoolgirl in Cement, the second feature to be produced centered around the torture and murder of this young girl. Unlike a concrete encased high school girl murder case, Juvenile Crime takes a much looser approach when focusing on the accuracies of Furuta's tragic ordeal. Instead, seemingly using Junko Furuta's tragedy as a plot device to create repeated graphic and long-winded scenes of gang rape and other acts of sexual violence. In fact, the film presents Furuta's murderers as the center focus of the picture, using Furuta herself as more of a prop for the male characters to exploit and destroy. Seven years later, Hiramu Nakamura's Concrete would be released in 2004. Based on Joji Atsumi's nonfiction novel of the same name, the film takes several liberties with many of the facts existing around the Junko Furuta case. Individuals' names have been changed, with Hiroshi Miyano's name being changed to Tatsu, and Junko Furuta's name being changed to Misaki. Similar to Juvenile Crime, Concrete focuses on Miyano's character as being the central focus throughout the film. With nearly 40 minutes of the feature passing before the character of Junko Furuta is even introduced. That said, out of all the films based on the Junko Furuta case, Concrete is by far the best cinematic production. It's clear this feature had a decent budget, its cinematography is impressive, and its acting is not half bad. Though despite these factors, I found this film to be quite frustrating as it attempts to present Miyano's character in a sympathetic light. In reality, all the individuals involved in Junko's torture and murder were apathetic to her suffering and death, and all of them went on to engage in violent criminal activity after they were released from prison. Lastly, while doing my research for this video, I came across a 2017 Indian film called Junko, directed by Abhinav Thankar. The film appears to star an all-Indian cast, and I was unable to find any physical release of the film. However, the feature is available to watch online. Like the previous titles mentioned, Junko as well seems to deviate away from historical accuracy, this time presenting Junko's killers as BDSM-obsessed, drug-crazed morons, often to such an extent that it is almost comical, and leaves me questioning if any of the actors involved have actually ever done drugs. The film's acts of violence are very tame, and are presented suggestively rather than graphically shown. The film does not cover any new ground from any of the other features focused on this topic, and worse, it presents Fruta's tragic ordeal in such a tame fashion it feels tiresome and boring. In the end, it is sad to see that history has not been forgiving with Junko Fruta's legacy as it has with other children who have lost their lives in similar fashion. The horrific lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till led him to be recognized as the sacrificial lamb of the civil rights movement, resulting in him becoming a household name throughout the world. The horrific torture and murder of 8-year-old Gabriel Fernandez led to significant restructuring and reform within child protective services within the U.S. Yet, Junko Furuta went through 40 days of absolute hell, enduring daily cruelty unimaginable to most, and she gets four shitty exploitation films as her legacy. As always, thank you for watching, and if you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share. Till next time, this is Cinema's Underbelly.